think? We're going to be talking about the immune system today. We're talking about the structure of viruses, and hopefully we'll get to talk about exactly what this vaccine is that everybody's getting and how it works. But let's just talk with, start with some basics. Why doesn't an antibiotic work on a virus, right? I mean, you go to the doctor with a sore throat and they swab your throat and they tell you, oh, you have strep throat, which means you have a bacteria called streptococcus living on the surface of your throat. And they give you an antibiotic and it works. But what if they swab your throat and they don't find any bacteria living in your throat? Then they say, oh, you're out of luck. You're just going to have to drink juice and lots of fluids and take some aspirin. What's that? Because a virus has a different system dividing? Mm, sort of. Kind of like that. Maybe we should talk about the nature of a bacteria versus a virus, right? So what's the difference between a bacteria and a virus, what's the biggest difference? Actually, they don't. You can get rid of bacteria. Oh, viruses, you mean viruses. Yes, you're right. Yes, I understand what you were saying. Yes. Um, but viruses, you're all saying correct things. Um, why is it viruses aren't living? That's it. That's it. Because you can kill a bacteria. An antibiotic is usually a chemical, often chemicals that are um, isolated from funguses, actually from molds, like penicillin, ampicillin, erythromycin. These are all chemicals that come from fungi. Uh, and these chemicals kill bacteria often because they dissolve the cell walls. That's one way you can kill a bacteria. Get rid of the cell wall, the bacteria will die. Some of them interfere with ribosomes, so they can't make proteins. That will also kill a bacteria. But that's the point. You can kill a bacteria. You can you can ingest some kind of antibiotic that will specific bacteria and leave your cells alone. With a virus, though, viruses are much tinier, first of all. They are not living. A virus is really nothing more than a bit of genetic material with a protein coat around it. It's not alive. You can't kill it. There are ways to stop it. We've learned some of those ways. But once a virus, I mean, the, some of the things that you were saying were correct. Once a virus gets into your body and injects its, its genetic material into your cells, it's, it's hiding inside those cells. And it's very hard to get at it. And it's hard to stop it once it's infected you because it's using your cells to make more of itself that then burst out and, and keep attacking attacking your cells right so but the but the reason why an antibiotic won't work is because antibiotics are looking for living cell parts to mess with and viruses don't have living cell parts they have a protein coat with protein receptors on it and a bit of dna or rna inside it. there you go so that's that's the first question that's why an antibiotic We'll work on a virus because by nature antibiotic means anti-life virus is not alive second question smallpox uh, was one of the very first diseases that people figured out how to stop with a vaccine it is caused by a virus um, and one of the first um, one of the first diseases that was um, that they developed a vaccine for was smallpox and one of the one of my favorite stories. I'm just going to go ahead and tell this story. Um, my favorite stories is about one of our founding fathers, John Adams. John Adams and Abigail Adams, his wife, was kind of a famous love story in our history. I don't know if you know a lot about them. They were um, unusually good friends first as a man as a man with his wife, and that was that was kind of unusual. Um, and, you know, she stayed behind on the farm in Boston with their five kids by herself for long periods of time while he was in Philadelphia helping to write the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and all those things, right? He was away from home a lot. She raised five kids by herself. And smallpox was a pandemic then, too. Smallpox was killing people all over the place. And they had developed a vaccine for it. It was a, it was a really primitive kind of uh, brutal way to be vaccinated. What they would do is they would take um, a person who was suffering from smallpox and had the boils and the 
blisters on their skin. And, um, and they would take, you would lie down in the same room with that person, and they would take, um, they would take a bit of the pus coming from the boils on a person's skin that contained all the immune factors that that sick person had developed against smallpox. And then they would cut you, they would make an incision in your skin until you bled. And they would rub the pus into your cut. And then they would bandage it. And then you would lie there and wait and hope that you wouldn't have a bad reaction. Abigail Adams took five little kids into town and she had herself and all of her children vaccinated with that first iteration of a smallpox vaccine. And it worked, saved their lives. Incredibly brave thing of, 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 of her to do. Incredibly science literate thing, scientifically literate, literate thing of her to do. A lot of lives were saved with that, with that first primitive vaccine. Um, but here's the question, why was smallpox so easy to, to obliterate with a single vaccine? And yet flu viruses never seem to go away. There seem to be hundreds of different strains of them. And you have to get a new flu vaccine every season. And sometimes it doesn't even work. You get sick anyway. Come on with that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Okay, that's it. So let me talk about that for a minute. So this is what's going on. If you look at a smallpox virus, I'm going to make a primitive drawing here. I don't know if it's right. Let's say that that's your smallpox virus and your flu virus. I'm always also going to draw a flu virus. Okay. And I don't know what the smallpox virus, you know, looks like. The flu virus we know is a coronavirus. The reason they call it that is because it looks like a crown, right? And in fact, all flu viruses, including COVID-19 right now, um, are circular with these proteins sticking out. I'm not sure about the smallpox virus. I'm just drawing a, a very simple diagram here. What's important though is what's on the inside of them. So it turns out that um, smallpox virus has its genetic material is in the form of DNA. We know what DNA is. DNA is that lovely ladder that's twisted and is double stranded and um, we also know, you also should remember that when DNA replicates itself, it's very good at checking for errors. DNA, when it replicates itself, checks for errors and makes sure there aren't any before it finishes replicating. On the other hand, um, and I'll just write that this is a DNA virus. And smallpox is known to be a DNA virus, right? That's DNA. Okay. So, predictably, now you're going to understand that flu viruses are not DNA viruses. They are RNA viruses, RNA, which is single-stranded and is not so good at checking for errors when it replicates itself. So, both of these viruses, you know, infect your cells. They use your cell machinery to replicate their genetic material and their surface proteins to make more viruses. That's the viral uh, life cycle. Well, it turns out that, and predictably, you can probably predict this too, the reason why RNA is so difficult to, to keep finding vaccines for these RNA viruses, like, like flu, and there's others like them, HIV is also an RNA virus, um, is because Um, RNA viruses, like flu and HIV, and there are others, mutate much faster. DNA viruses have error checking mechanisms when it replicates. So it doesn't mutate as fast. And one vaccine can handle it. Rather simple way of saying it, but essentially that's correct. 
On the other hand, any viruses that have RNA as their genetic material will often mutate faster. The RNA um, doesn't replicate itself exactly sometimes. And that's going to require, um, that, that might require um, an update of a vaccine. And this is why there are so many versions of flu viruses that can attack humans. And COVID is just the newest one. So I thought, I hope that's helpful in kind of introducing this unit to you a little bit. Okay. So I'm just going to stop this little bit. Are there any questions about this so far? Just this introduction here. Does this make sense to you? I'm going to take a yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, and quite quite an interesting story about John and Abigail. It's just it's just amazing to me. It's amazing to me that that they had a way of vaccinating people way back when, and that it actually worked. Um, in any case, um, there is a COVID vaccine, COVID nineteen vaccine right now. Uh, the two companies that are developing it are uh, Pfizer and Moderna. And they call these vaccines, um, I, I believe they are, the version of, that they're using is an mRNA vaccine. And I thought it might be a good thing to explain that to you. So let me explain. That means, even rhymes, mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. What exactly does that mean? It doesn't really have to do with the fact that COVID is an RNA virus. That's not what's, what's really going on. You can make a messenger RNA vaccine for any virus. What they did was they took, they generally, what they take is they take the surface proteins or whatever is part of the protein coat. Right? So they take those surface proteins and let's say, you know, that you've got a little protein there. And in the case of the coronavirus, it's called a spike protein, right? So you've got this protein that has a certain shape and they reverse engineer it. So they isolate this protein and reverse engineer it to identify, identify the genetic code that codes for it. Okay. Remember this from freshman year, that when you synthesize a protein, when a cell normally synthesizes a protein, right? Normal protein synthesis has two steps. You go from the DNA code, right? Well, you know, A, T, T, G, C, C, T, T, A, A, like that. Right. And then that is transcribed into an RNA code, right? Into a, into a messenger RNA code, right? Which for example here would be, ah, what would be complementary code for A? Remember this? So I'll go ahead and transcribe it. See if you agree with me. U, A, A. C, G, C, U, U, no, not U, U, sorry, A, A, U, U. Did I get it right? You guys are awful quiet today. Okay, um, yes, I, got, yeah, I think so too, yes. Okay. Yay. Thank you. All right. So then the last step is that each of the three letters, remember this? Remember this from freshman year? Each of the three letters is called a codon, and each codon codes for an amino acid in the sequence of a protein, right? So then you have a polypeptide. 
Hopefully, amino acid sequence, right? Right, which is the result of the messenger RNA then being translated with using a ribosome. Okay, so what they did was they they got this protein here. They took this protein and they figured out this. What messenger RNA code, right, will result in, if we inject it into human bodies, will result in our bodies naturally making a bunch of those little spike proteins, viral spike proteins, right? Now, why would we want a human body to do that? Why would that be useful? To have your body make the spike proteins that used to be over here, right? All the proteins that were on that live virus. You're not injecting people with the virus, but you're injecting them with a tool that's going to allow their own cells, their own ribosomes to make those little proteins, those viral proteins. Why would we do that? Why would that be a really good way to vaccinate someone? What is the human cell, what is the body, what is your immune system going to do with those proteins? Well, let me tell you. Once these proteins, right, these viral proteins are made by your cells, it triggers your immune system to, to react and form antibodies for these, and it does that without triggering all the dangerous inflammatory symptoms. Inflammatory without yes. That's basically it. That's basically how this vaccine is working. And there's a lot more detail that I want to give you. I'm not finished yet. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop at this point, though, because that, that's a good basic intro.